Welcome to the Power of We podcast. I am your host, Nisa Brown Springman, and the founder of Ignite Your Life. Ignite is a women's holistic health, fitness, and lifestyle community. And for the past 17 years, I have had the honor, privilege, and blessing of being the recipient of the wisdom, strength, knowledge, encouragement, and inspiration that comes from being part of this incredible community. And I want you in on that. In Ignite, this is what we call the power of we. The power of we is the philosophy that Ignite is built upon, which is that two is better than one and that God created us for community and to do life together. In this podcast, I will have conversations with a wide range of women over a wide range of topics that will provide you with wisdom, knowledge, inspiration, and encouragement. So get ready to be empowered, y'all, because here we go. I am so excited for you to listen to episode 10 of the Power of We podcast with the one and only Simone Prezine. Simone has been an Ignite member for the last 15 years. In fact, we just celebrated her 15th Ignite anniversary. And Simone, like you, is extraordinary. But one of the things that makes her extraordinary is just this super unique story of hers that occurred when she was in college studying abroad and fell off of a ferry boat in the Adriatic Sea at one o'clock in the morning and was rescued by the Sherpin. So Simone has been in the process of writing a book for several years now and we recorded this podcast in November of 2022 so it's been a little bit But we've been waiting for the right time to launch, and we thought now was the right time. So you are just going to be amazed by the story, the inspiration, the, I don't know, just like all the miracles that occurred for Simone uh, to be able to tell the story, to have survived, and then tell the story and share with us. So enjoy. Hello, Simone. Welcome to the Power of We podcast. This is so exciting. Um, okay, I want to give a little insight into mine and your relationship and um, and then dive into just your incredible story and what you've been doing mm. for a long time and also touch on, you know, your really important job um, and role, which is being a mother and a wife and now a storyteller. So um, anyway, this is my dear friend, Simone, and she's been an Ignite member since 2009, February of yes. 2009. That's a very long time to stay committed to anything, more or less a fitness program. So thank you. And it well, wasn't- it's, that's because of you, just you and all your wonderful leaders. We do have a great team, but thank you for that. Thank you. Um, and so Simone is, uh, started off as a client and then turned real quickly into a very dear friend. And she's also a wife and a mother and a retreat enthusiast. And we'll touch on that at the very end. But She's also an author and she's in the process of writing a book and she has an incredible story to tell that I cannot wait for you all to hear because what the Power of We podcast is all about is about sharing our experiences in life and giving that wisdom and encouragement uh, through our hard times, through our good times, our hard times, all of the above, so that we can then in turn, like our words, our experiences can be a source of, of wisdom and encouragement and empowerment to other women. So your story definitely is that, Simone. And But first, before Mm. we get into that, I would love for you to tell everybody where you're from, um, where you currently live, who you're married to, how long have you been married, and who your children are. So let's start with where are you from? Okay. Well, and thank you also for inviting me here today, um, Nisa. I love seeing you. It's a lifelong dream to do this. I am. I say that I'm originally from Seattle because I lived there with my mom technically the longest. Um, growing up, my father was in the military, and we traveled a lot. And uh, we really didn't live in one place for very long. So I say I'm from Seattle. Um, I moved to Austin, Texas, here uh, '95, and I am. Uh, I am married to Sean. And we've been married, oh my gosh, for 22 years now, happily married 22 years. I met him. uh, He was my next door neighbor and he is from New York City. 
and Wait, I was from the West Coast. Next neighbor where? In here Seattle? in Austin. Oh, really? No, here in Austin. I always forget yep. that. Okay, got it. He was my neighbor. Anyway, and uh, yeah, we got along really well. and We've been together ever since. And so, yeah, 22 years later, and we have three incredible, awesome children. Um, it's Matt, he, Max, Ben, and Olivia. Max is 20. Oh, my gosh. That's crazy to oh say. Oh, my gosh. I cannot believe that. Uh-uh. Oh, my gosh. My son, Ben, is 17. And my daughter, Olivia, is 16. So college and high school. College and high school. And you'll have a really exciting weekend coming up because tell everybody what's going on. So here in Texas, if you don't know, football apparently is a huge deal. And our Westlake High School has won 51 consecutive football games and has been in three state championships and have won. And my son is a football player and my daughter is a cheerleader. So our life is football and cheer right now. And yes, they're playing in a playoff game tomorrow night, as a matter of fact. And where is the playoff game? Tomorrow is in New Braunfels. We're oh, playing against right. the unicorns. Against the unicorns. <laughs> the unicorns. And what time is that playoff game? 7.30 Central PM. Okay. Well, 7.30 PM Central time. Yes, yes. That's so exciting. And there's nothing it is. better than college. I mean, sorry, high school sports. There, it's good. High it's school football. It's <laughs> good a good stuff. game. Right. Yeah. Almost did like you basketball. Grow, did you? Well, you know, still football is pretty special. Um, <laughs> being your basketball coach, he would understand and recognize that too. Uh, do you, did you grow up around football much in Seattle or with all of your no. travel whereabouts? No, um, I really can't say. I mean, I absolutely supported my Washington State Cougars mm-hmm. and um, our rivals, the University of Washington Huskies, even though I probably shouldn't say that. But so though and then, of course, our Seattle Seahawks. Um, oh, but yeah. now here in Texas, you know, support where we're at. So, Just but no, your, not really. I'm sure it took your um, maybe f- appreciation and understanding of football to a whole other level. Uh, Absolutely. You can't, you can't live in Texas and not go there a little bit. You know, it's all around. No. Well, okay. I love it all. Yes, me too. There's nothing like it. Um, okay, so so Simone has got a fascinating story to share. And we learned about this. Simone, I was thinking back and trying to remember mm-hmm. when you shared this with us. And I remember just C- Kathleen telling me, you're not going to believe this. I'm like, what? And she told me about your story and it blew all of our mind. And then every time we go anywhere with you or you, we put you on the spot and say, Simone, you have to, you have to tell your story. And you always are so generous in telling the story. And so now you're writing a book about this story. Mm. And as I was thinking about it, and we'll get there about what this story is all about, just a little tease. But as I was thinking about it, I was thinking, you know, so many times in life, our hardships, there's an overlap. Um, we, because I would say very rare in life, does anybody go through something that no one else has ever experienced? Um, they might be different experiences, but nonetheless similar. And we can draw on, we can draw strength from knowing that someone else went through something that we are going through or we've gone through and we can get through it like they did too. But your experience is not one that most people have experienced. And when I thought about that, not like pretty quick before I, or right before we got on to this podcast, that kind of blew my mind. So that took my Hmm. curiosity to a whole other level about the, how did you get through what you, what you got through? And again, we'll, we'll talk about that. I want to, I want you to tell the story, but um, I'm just going to, open it up to you and say, go ahead and tell us about um, what happened, what you're writing this book about, your whole, ex- your experience. Let's just, well, start with what you fell off of a ferry boat. Um, well, going back to, uh, I remember exactly where we were when, uh, we, when the story came up and it's okay. usually not a story that I, you know, just come out with, but somehow it genuinely just weaves its way into things. So my story comes up kind of frequently, but um, we were at Zach's in Austin, a restaurant in Austin, a yeah. restaurant with one of another Ignite member, Chris. And 
uh, ironically, she made the comment, we were talking maybe about traveling, but she made the comment saying, gosh, well, my biggest fear would be falling <laughs> off a ship and just lost in the ocean. And which is what we're going to talk about in a minute, because yes. that is my story, oh my part God. of it. And it was kind of ironic. And I mean, I kind of had to laugh and say, well, you know, yeah, it, I don't recommend it, but it, it can happen. And so anyway, that's kind of, and Kathleen was there. I think yes. that's how essentially it started. But the gist of the story, which I try to yeah, share. Um, so how old were you? And yep. what was that? So it was in 19, it was June, 1991. I was 21 years old and my best friend and sorority sister, Tina, and I had just finished a study abroad program. Uh, I was in Italy and she was in France and we were about to, when school ended, we were going to backpack around Europe for the remainder of the summer. And the first place that we wanted to go to was Greece. And in order to do that, we had to take a overnight train to Brindisi, Italy. And from there, we would arrive in the morning. And at 1030 that night, we were going to catch a ferry that would take us to Corfu, Greece. Well, when we arrived that morning, shortly thereafter, uh, we met some other travelers. And two in particular were Larry and Tanya. Larry was uh, this very handsome, striking, had this beautiful, captivating smile, and I was instantly drawn to him. Um, I was absolutely thrilled a little after to find out that he and Tanya were just friends. Can I ask like, you a question real fast? Where were they from? Oh, thank you. Uh, actually, ironically, they were two students from University of Texas here in Austin. Um, and then as Tina and I were from Washington State University, it was, and now I live in Austin. It's a little ironic, I guess, there. But they were from uh, Texas. And so, uh, you know, as college students, we just kind of bantered back and forth with all of our, uh, with our songs, the university songs. Uh, but we got to spend the day with Larry and Tanya. And that gave uh, Larry and I uh, more time to um, get to know each other. And um, we really, truly had um, an instant connection. And Later that evening, we were all enjoying drinks and dinner, and we were getting along so well, and like we were old friends, that we decided the four of us we were going to travel together when we went to Greece, and then you know spend a couple weeks there and see where where that would go. Um, we boarded the ferry later that evening, and around midnight, Tina and Tanya were tired, so um, they decided to go um, where our, our stuff was in the cabins, and uh, well, not really cabins; it was one of the levels where. The, uh, they had seats and they were going to go turn in for the night. Uh, Larry and I wanted to spend more time together. So we found a nice secluded place on the back of the boat and enjoyed our time there. Um, that was, uh, you know, giddy with kisses and, um, you know, just the raw emotions coming out. We talked about life and everything and trying to solve all the world's problems. Um, but we were enjoying each other's company. Um, we decided we needed to turn in as well. And as we were walking back to go join uh, Tanya and Tina, um, we decided to have one more kiss. And he picked me up and swept me around and set me on the railing. And as we were embraced in a wonderful kiss, um, next thing I knew, the unthinkable, um, I opened my eyes and I was falling overboard. I fell. 40 feet into the Adriatic Sea. Um, when I popped my head up out of the water, uh, I saw Larry's head pop up out of the water because he jumped in after me. Uh, we yelled for the boat. Nobody saw us go overboard. Um, nobody was on the boat. So our screams, uh, we just kept yelling and nobody heard us. So the boat just drifted off into the night. Can I um, ask you a question? Sure. So that's like one of my worst like the ocean, the, the dark, deep, unknown. And when you were falling overboard, I'm sure your body wasn't, you weren't able to process everything that was going on at the time. Um, but did you have any kind of thought when you were falling off? Was it like, oh my God, I'm about to die? Was there, was there any kind of thought process that you experienced? 
it wasn't so much being able to think because it happened really quickly and everything, even though it was in slow motion, the actions, it was in a split second. So the reality came more, um, you know, once, once I hit that water, um, yeah, did you, you got like a cacophony of bubbles. Land on your back, your head. How did you land? Because I would imagine falling 40 feet. Were you at the very top of the ferry? Uh, we were on a third level. Okay, third level. About that- 40 feet up. There were two more levels above us. Okay, but that's a hard, long fall. It uh, is, and actually hitting the water at that um, height, is it feels kind of like concrete. Mm-hmm. But yeah. Um, yeah, I probably went in kind of on my back, and I rolled in. Um, so I didn't necessarily at that point feel um, nothing in my no bones had been broken or whatnot. So it wasn't that I was experiencing that as much as just the true shock of yes. like, what the heck just happened? Right. Mm-hmm. That was kind of, it was more of a shock factor. And then Larry pops up and I'm sure that, you were relieved. It, it was relief and uh, kind of like, oh shit. So, um, mm-hmm. but when he popped up, yeah, he, you know, he just kept saying, Swan, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. And I was just saying, no, Larry, no, 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 it's going to be okay. So, um, yes, I wish he had stayed on the boat. However, I was very thankful to have him there. Um, mm-hmm. What that allowed us to do um, together, we, um, you, you'd ask kind of, you know, the, about the water and stuff. Um, ironically, that evening, um, it, the water was just smooth is glass and the stars were absolutely gorgeous that night. It was very peaceful, even though there was kind of trauma and chaos going on around us, but it was actually a very peaceful setting. Um, but it gave Larry and I the opportunity together to kind of figure out what we were going to do in that moment. And, um, we ultimately off in the distance, saw this teeny tiny little bump off of the horizon, but, um, it gave us something to set our sights on. So you could do a 360 and not see anything except for this teeny tiny bump on the horizon, which we didn't really know what it was. But again, we got to focus on it and start swimming towards it. So um, at, at any point in those, that initial 30 minutes to the first hour that you, or before you set your sights on the horizon or that little spot out there, were either of you, I mean, I love that it was such a peaceful, <laughs> calm night and clearly you're, um, you have, you both have the ability to just stay calm, but was one of you a little frantic at least at, at that initial state? Yeah. And that's a great question. I've always attributed that. Um, I think Larry always realized more of the situation that we were in the direness of the situation we were in over myself. I chose or I focused more on really not thinking about that. I think my mind kind of went into somewhat of a survival mode too, of not really thinking about what could possibly happen. I felt more of like, oh yeah, no, 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 we're gonna, we're okay. We got this, we can get through this. And so um, I just, yeah. So Larry overall showed more concern about things overall, I think, than I did because he was the more practical one. And um, I was like, no, we're going to, we're okay. We can do this. You had, you so. had, the, the ex- you had high expectations. <laughs> you didn't. Um, so it's pesky okay, so expectations. What, yes, yes. So about what time of night, was it midnight that you, that this happened? So we fell over about one o'clock in the morning. Okay. Um, Larry was wearing his watch. So I did. Um, that's how I know it was one o'clock in the morning. Um, and really what we did, um, again, if we'd set our, sites on this bump. Uh, We spent the next hours um, essentially swimming. Uh, We floated and we treaded water. And that's what we did for many hours. In those hours, um, it just, it gave Larry and I, again, another opportunity. Um, We got to talk a lot. Uh, We talked about things, I think, that just kind of kept us going. And inevitably, we talked about where we were going to go and Greece and where we were going to travel and all the great things that we were going to be able to do and see. And at one point, um, I mean, he literally just said, you know, well, if we get through this, you know, we're going to get married. And I remember saying, not if we get through this, it's when we get through this, 
yeah, we are going to get married. And then, you know, we got to enjoy talking about what kind of wedding we were going to have and how many kids we were going to have. And I think, I know, and it sounds, it might sound kind of crazy of having these types of conversations maybe so quickly, but I think that when you're, so Larry and I clearly had an instant um, connection together. And then when you're thrown into literally a life and death situation like that, you know, there was no games. There was just, again, I go back to that kind of that raw emotion. And so we got to really be in it. And uh, we genuinely, I believe we genuinely felt that, you know, we had a love and that we were going to get married and that we were going to do life together. Well, and so, and I would imagine you have to, I mean, even if that was a fairy tale, um, it, it, you, you're, you had to keep a mindset of hope and optimism and what's, what's next. And if that's where you have to go in that moment, to get through mm-hmm. it, that's where you have to go. So about the water, was it pretty mild as far as temperature was concerned? So uh, the amount of things that technically were in my favor, I feel like when you look at everything mm-hmm. with my accident, that I believe was another great thing of all the things that could go wrong. Um, because it was June, it was literally the middle of June and summer was there. So the water temperature was in that kind of in that 68 to 72 degrees, more in the 72 degrees. Um, so the water was technically warmer than it would normally be throughout the year. But um, when you're in it for an extended length of time, um, you know, it's not good. Your body can't handle that. Hypothermia absolutely sets in. So um, when the sun, because the sun wasn't out, you know, three, four o'clock in the morning, the darkest hours, it was absolutely um, felt like you were swimming in a bucket of ice. It was absolutely very cold. Did you have to, did both he and you, because I would assume you had shoes on and you needed to get rid of as much as you could. Did y'all get rid of some shoes and some clothes in order to not have it weigh you down? Yes. As a matter of fact, um, probably around, you know, probably about 10, 15 minutes into our swim, we really were realizing that our clothes were weighing us down. And so we decided to create less drag. We would remove as much as we could. Um, Larry went down to his shorts and I went down. Um, I took off my, um, my shirt and le- left me in my shorts. Um, he did take off his tennis shoes. I was wearing Tina's sandals at the time and then kicked those off. And literally to this day, she still gives me a hard time about losing her favorite pair of sandals in the middle of the Adriatic. Have you tried so, to, to um, replenish those sandals no, or them no. look alike? <laughs> no, not at all. Oh my gosh. No. Yeah, you're like, me surviving is plenty yeah. of the reward here. Um, um, okay, so y'all are out in the middle of the ocean. It's pitch black. It's so cold. All right, so again, I have... A, probably Chris's fear that she expressed to you being in the middle of the ocean, having fallen overboard, that one of them would rank up there for me too. How in the world, because when I think about, I mean, I can just go in the ocean and all of a sudden with people all around and be able to stand up and, and my, and can think of a shark and I will start kind of <gasps> feel my heart start racing. So was that ever I thought, I mean, I know you had to stay so fierce mentally, um, but did you ever think, oh my God, there are probably sharks underneath me and are we going to get eaten or attacked? So those thoughts um, did come into play, but not until later in the day. Um, I'll back up a little bit. With Larry and I, uh, after several hours of Larry and I swimming together, um, after the sun had risen, so we were probably together about five or six hours, he just started spitting up a lot of water and choking. And um, I wanted desperately to help him. And all I wanted to do was to take my hand and put it under his chin so that he would stop taking in so much water because we were so physically and utterly exhausted. I, I, I tried to will my hand literally out of the water 
but it felt like I had a ton of bricks on it. And I literally couldn't get my hand out of the water to help him. All I could do was close my eyes and drift back to sleep. And that was the last time I ever saw Larry. Mm-hmm. Do you think so? The that, remainder. Sorry, go ahead. Well, the remainder of the day, then I'm by myself and I was in pure survival mode. And so later in the day, uh, things would, I was going in and out of consciousness, but there was a period that I felt something brush by my leg. And I do think it could have been a shark. And, uh, but I remembered reading a story in Reader's Digest as a kid where a man was in a dinghy and there were sharks surrounding his boat and he just took an oar and he like knocked it in the head and the sharks went away. So for me, I thought, well, okay, if a shark comes, I'm going to kick it in the head and it'll go away and I don't have to worry about that anymore. So. Okay. So note to self, <laughs> in the event we ever find ourselves in those situations, yeah, hit them in the nose, the face. I've heard, <laughs> I've heard the same thing too, but I'm, you know, a Jaws generation baby. And so that's all I can think about is, uh, I mean, as if this situation is not awful enough, you're stranded in the middle of the Adriatic Sea. You've just lost the person that you had kind of fantasized about potentially marrying. And um, how did you, I know you said you were going in and out of consciousness, were you just floating on your back pretty much the whole time? At that point, yes. Um, I could still swim once in a while, but floating on my back um, in the middle of the Adriatic, you're very buoyant in that salt water. So floating um, to me came very, very easily. Um, It was not as easy, I don't think, for Larry. I think he struggled to stay afloat a lot harder than I did. Um, So I found it... um, at times I drew strength from finding how soothing it was. Um, Mm -hmm. My hair would fan out in the ocean. I could hear the rhythmic sounds of the water and my breathing was very, very calm. And so I found peace in that when I would just kind of let myself go. And that's yes. So I, and I could fall asleep and drift in and out of sleep by doing that. So when you realized that Larry was no longer with you, did you, again, I know you were so mentally and physically fatigued at that point. Could you even fully grasp what had just happened? Could could you even admit that to yourself or go there? No. And I think that my mind specifically, um, again, when I say survival mode, I think that my mind just uh, move that reality to the side. And I, because in my mind, I was talking to myself like, oh, okay, Larry's not here right now, but he's going to meet up with me later. I'll catch up with him. He'll be around. So my mind wouldn't allow me to go there, which I'm mm-hmm. grateful for. Um, which is so no, funny. I didn't have that. And that in and of itself, how the body protects itself in mm-hmm. such extreme um cases Mm -hmm. of shock or trauma. And I know it eventually kind of comes up later in life, but it really is a miracle that that can happen, that that's what what goes on um, when we have to survive and we just super compartmentalize and focus only on what we have to focus Mm -hmm. on. So then um, did you ever get closer to that one little spot that y'all were going towards? And did you ever figure out what that was? I did. I uh, finally, maybe mid morning ish, I could have a better, I had a clearer picture of it. And to me, it looked like um, kind of a big rock in the ocean or I should see in the sea. And um, I was afraid that if I got closer to it, it looked like, you know, I would, I was imagining that the, the water was crashing up onto the waves and it's, it's not like it had a beach or something. It wasn't that type of a, um, you know, a figure. So um, it was just more of a rocky cliff. And I realized that my, um, I wouldn't have had the strength to be able to fight any type of a current. And so um, I, in my mind, again, from a survival aspect, I decided I better not go towards that anymore. um, Because I don't know if, if I get too close to that, I don't think I'm going to be able to, I don't have the energy to fight that. And then ironically, around that time, off in the distance, I saw one of the other boats going back, what I perceived back to Italy. 
And so I thought, well, I won't head to that bump anymore. I'm going to turn around and I'm going to go back out, swim back out to where I fell overboard. And I will try to flag a ship down and try to get some help. That was my And was that just logic. so disorienting for you? I can't imagine being in the middle of the middle of the sea and even knowing which direction you had just swam from. Right. Um, what I thought was logical was extremely illogical because okay. you don't just turn around yeah. and, um, you know, so no, <laughs> it wasn't, okay. but it made okay. sense I'm, to me at the time. You've got an incredible navigation system. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. navigation nope. system. It just made sense. Yeah. Cause if anything, I was floating along with a current that was very, very, very strong and literally was sending me towards Albania. So oh, no. Oh my gosh. Mm. So how far, okay. Um, and we'll get to the rescue, but real quick. How far did you travel? Do you did you ever figure that out from the time you fell off the ferry to when you were rescued? Um, I actually don't know the miles of it. It's it's you know nautical miles. It's it's kind of hard to gather. However, and I will talk about my guys, the my saviors. Um, the the distance from where I fell off to where I ended up, um, it's like impossible. So, so no one can figure out how I got so far. So, um, I mean, you know, it's over 50 miles. I mean, I wasn't even within 50, you know, 15 miles, I think from the nearest piece of land after Italy. So, um, I don't know the actual distance, but the Adriatic sea is over 60,000 square feet of miles. So 60,000 so square miles, a long distance and a little amount of time, which right. is, um, kind of unexplainable. Mm-hmm. So maybe there one of the little... many unexplainables. Yeah, I'm just thinking there's definitely uh, some divine intervention in this story with you. Okay, so you're floating, and about uh, how so the sun starts to rise. How does that make you feel? Do you feel comforted by the sun? Are you starting to warm up at all? Absolutely, I was so grateful um, because the the coldness was really hard, um, in the morning to overcome. It was, it was extremely cold. Um, then I was grateful for the sun to come up because it finally gave me a reprieve to warm my body. But then when you're floating in the sun or swimming in the sun for that many hours, then it was my enemy again, because it fried me and, uh, burnt my skin and, um, it was then it was too hot. <laughs> so Yeah. yeah it's hard yeah. to say that way. No, I then I, I was it. burned. Yeah, burned and dehydrated and exhausted. Dehydrated. Yeah. Um, had you ingested a lot of water like Larry too, or were do you recall that? <laughs> no, I mean I it's I didn't really swallow water. Um I was able to catch myself from doing that. But I, I, in, I inhaled a lot. I took a lot of salt water in my mouth. Um, mm-hmm. I just didn't thankfully swallow it because that's mm-hmm. not good for you to swallow salt water. But I had had enough salt water in my mouth throughout the days that um, it just ate through my mouth and made yeah. my tongue and gums and everything raw. Mm. So that, that wasn't very good. Um, yeah. But kind of going along in the day, the, the, uh, one of the beautiful things was um, throughout the day. So um, later in the day when, I mean, full dehydration, exhaustion, hypothermia, everything, my body was basically shutting down. And after, so about 18 hours, then after the actual accident, um, I really was unconscious. My body's not going to last much longer. Um, I feel something hit me in the head and I open my eyes and there in front of me is a life preserver and nine wonderful uh, Austrian men who had been sailing the around the the water um, happened upon me. Um, Speaking of just orchestrally or divinely orchestrated, um, they based on a beautiful girl in a bar fight and lots and lots of issues with their boat. They were four days off of their course and they hadn't seen any boats at all that day. 
um, and they happened upon me at 7, 10 p.m. on June 19th, 1991. And um, they rescued me. They saved my life. Oh, my goodness. Okay, so I just got chills when you said, when you just said they were off course. This was not the plan for them. Like they were supposed to have already been through that. So <laughs> when you, so you were drifting off, um, completely exhausted, um, probably not going to be able to last a lot longer. Did you, I'm sure they were yelling for you, but you were so gone that you never even heard their voices. I never saw the boat come upon me. Um, about that time of the day, um, well, somewhere later part of the day, uh, the weather changed and um, it's not that a storm brew, brew or came in, but it did start raining and I ended up in these nine and 12 foot swells swimming in. So when they happened upon me, the swells were about nine feet high. And so, um, and I was trying to find them, I, I not find them, but I was, when I would rise up onto a wave, um, I was able to look around and try to see something. And then, you know, I would sink back down into the trough of the wave. Um, I never saw them come upon me. So I had probably been out for a little bit um, and I didn't hear their voices. And actually when they finally pulled me onto the boat, um, I couldn't see anything. I could barely hear them. Um, I had no ability to even move my muscles. And those are signs that um, your body's fading, your body's going away. So, so they I pulled you onto the boat and they didn't speak English. Only Christoph spoke English. Um, it took a while to figure out what language any of us were. Um, mm. And uh, they were speaking German and Italian and um, they were, they were all from Austria. Um, but Christoph was the only one on the boat that spoke the most English. And he was the one I always call him my savior. He was the one that I was able to communicate with. And then he was doing all the translation to the captain of the boat, like to get help and things like that. And so, okay, your friends on the ferry, what was going on with them during all this time? I know you found this out after the fact, but I'm sure they were freaking out and panicked. So what were they doing and how did you end up meeting back up with them? Um, you could literally do an entire podcast on their story as well. And when you're mentioning Tina um, and her shoes, uh, the least I could do for her really would be to get her a new pair of shoes because um, I am blessed to have a best friend that um, would not give up on me nor, um, and she knew I would never leave her. So she spent, she and Tanya basically had to spend from the minute that they woke up in the morning, which they woke up based on the, um, the horn blast. The first stop was Corfu at seven in the morning. Um, but they had to wake up at first, didn't really think much about it, but we didn't show up to disembark from the boat and they had all of our, our pack, our, our, our suitcases, well, our packs. Um, so basically they had to spend though the next eight hours going from Corfu to the next stop, which was Patras. And in those eight hours, they finally had to figure out that something really was wrong, that we truly were missing. Um, they tried to get help from the captain and the crew of the boat and nobody, um, was being responsive to them. They blew they just off. Kind of dismissing it like two crazy teenagers or mm -hmm. college students. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Cause they probably get lots of, um, it's a big college, you know, fairy time that, you know, drinking and whatnot that like leads to things. And they probably were just dismissing her absolutely of just saying, you know, oh, this happens all the time. They're fine. You'll find them later. Um, but nothing, you know, would add up. Um, but they had to spend eight hours doing that. And then by the time they were in Patras, um, you know, they just still didn't receive any help. Nobody sent a search party out. And um, that was super tragic in and of itself. They were in another country. I mean, how in the world do you even mm -hmm. now? And this was in the nineties. You didn't have cell phones. There wasn't like email. Wow. Nope. It's all so, organic communication, which is why so, yeah, in eight hours, it wasn't like she could sit there on her phone tracking down information or making calls. She had to just wait, you know, try oh, to get help. Gosh. And mm -hmm. so she contacted, was it your dad? <laughs> When they got to Patras, 
poor Tina, um, then from Patras had to go to the American embassy, which is in Athens, Greece. So she had to take a train, which was another eight hours to go to the American embassy and wait till it opened the next morning. So we had, you know, this is still like, this is more than 24 hours, it's 36 hours later. And so, um, but when she got to the embassy, that is where the first part that they actually realized there was an issue. And that was the first time that she was really getting help from the office in the embassy is when she had to call my dad. And I'm sure that conversation was not an easy one. But your dad being in the mm-hmm. military was, I'm sure, a very, uh, and I say this lovingly, probably stoic. And we're just going to, we're going to figure it out. Like, let's create yep. a plan and let's execute the plan. So what was the plan? Yeah, to I mean, you nailed it. Plan. Yeah, you nailed it. And um, yeah, it was, that was the first time Tina too, you know, really, you know, when you're calling the father, you yeah. know, telling, trying to give him that kind of news, that's, um, you know, it's very emotional. Um, and Tina knew my dad. So, um, but yes, uh, he actually went in, he was working at the Pentagon at the time. And so in his mind, he thought, well, maybe I can go to the Pentagon and see if there's anything I can do to help her. Um, thankfully by the time he got into work later, um, I had been found in the hospital. So, but he did have a plan of his own to try to figure out what he could do for me in Virginia. While I was in the Adriatic. (laughs) Of course, that daddy would have done anything to find his daughter. Okay, real fast. How long had you and Tina been friends? Well, we met in college. So we had met um, in 1988. So it was our freshman year that we had met. We were juniors at this time and going into our senior year. So I'd known her for three years. Okay, which is not a long time to know somebody. So you guys just really hit it off and were made for one another. We Uh, were. friends, And we are. She still is my bestie today. Oh, mm-hmm. I love it. Well, maybe we will bring her on and we'll do a whole, tell us your <laughs> story. Um, oh okay, God. So, yeah. Yeah. That'd be so good. Okay. So you get rescued and then what, where do they take you? When do you come in con? And like, what are the next steps? Rescued. I, they take me, um, interestingly enough, again, um, again, with all of my little divinely orchestrated things. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the captain called Adam, the captain called the port authority in Corfu, explained what had happened. Um, they said, well, come to them and they would, uh, you know, basically come to them, which was about four hours by boat to them. And basically Adam said, she's not going to make it for four hours, mm-hmm. you, you know? So, so just by chance, somebody had overheard the distress signal in the call and a Greek man who spoke German heard the conversation and said, Hey, you're two hours away from Ericosa Island and there's a doctor that's in town for the weekend. And if you go there, we'll call him and, you know, maybe he can help. So they took me two hours away to the nearest piece of land, basically, which was an island called Ericosa. And the port authority from Corfu met us in Ericosa. And and that island, I did have a doctor that helped me. He was amazing, Dr. Dimitri. And um, um, he just couldn't figure out how I was alive. He called me a medical miracle because um, my body was completely shut down. My heartbeat was racing too fast. I had hypothermia, had a second degree burn, um, my fever, I had a very high fever. and um, and I, I wasn't, I wasn't doing very well, but I came to pretty quickly. So, Were you, but after that, he took me to Athens or to Corfu. Do you recall being on that boat and then taking you like being with the the men in the boat and then getting you where, were you kind of in and out of consciousness? Yeah, I thought I was completely awake like the entire time, but apparently I wasn't. So I found that out later from my guys. Um, but, uh, no, I mean, I actually had a pretty rapid recovery based on anything. And so um, I did get to rest. Um, I was, I'm sorry, my your piece keeps falling out. I did, um, when we got to Ericosa, uh, when I was in the hospital room there, they had a little clinic and I started, uh, my body signs started basically quitting. And um, I don't know what Dr. Dimitri gave me some type of an adrenaline type shot, 
but it instantly revived me. And I basically was fine after that. And, um, but the port authority from Corfu came in medicine, Aracosta, and then they took me from their medics on their rescue ship and took me to a hospital in Corfu. And there, um, you know, I was on a bunch of hydro, you know, antibiotics and hydration. Um, you know, they hydrated me and whatnot. Uh IVs. Thank you. So when did you see, when did you see Tina and your dad or your mom? And what was like that? What was that like? Hmm. It was uh, probably, it was over 36 hours and I'd been in the hospital for a night. Um, Tina and I had had a conversation on the phone before she uh, left Patras after Athens and then found out where I was in the hospital. Um, we'd had a phone conversation. Um, so she knew where I was, but she didn't, wasn't able to get to me until the following day. And, uh, yeah, I was sitting up in my bed and, um, you know, the minute she walked into that door, <laughs> it's still, I still remember it because the minute she walked in that door, um, you know, seeing her after what had we been through, um, I just, yeah, it was a very emotional and uh, we just embraced each other and hugged and I profusely apologized mm-hmm. you know, to her for putting her through that. Mm. And uh, yeah, um, so that was, yeah, that was me seeing Tina. So mm-hmm. remember, mm, I love her. Wow. So, uh, those, are, yeah. those are some very raw and real emotions. Um, well, and she thought you were probably dead. There was probably a period of time mm-hmm. where she, um, that, that had to be a consideration. I, I don't know. Have I lost my best friend? And so there, I yeah. that well, and about she, that time, we'd also probably known the reality is that Larry had probably not survived mm-hmm. tr- um, officially. And so um, nobody really wanted to acknowledge that, but she was mm-hmm. understanding of that. And we actually had had that conversation um, mm-hmm. when she came into the, into the room, we had to acknowledge that. So uh, that was my, another question I wanted to ask you was, uh, did you realize pretty soon on that, that, that he did not make it, that reality had sunk in. It was, I was still hopeful because I thought, you know, it was crazy that I was even found that there's mm-hmm. still a chance, mm-hmm. you know, that he could be out there. Um, I think the reality for me hit me, um, when I got out of the hospital, I was in the hospital in Corfu for three days. And, um, when I got out, uh, Tina and Tanya had had a room at this little, uh, little hotel down the street. And when I walked in, all of our packs were laying up against the wall. Mm -hmm. And there was just something about that moment. Um, Seeing Larry's pack um, Mm -hmm. was really, I think when I just had the reality that, yeah, he's not here, but I felt I could, I felt him. Mm -hmm. I felt like I felt him and just, um, but I really, that was when I feel like I knew. So how was Tanya? Did y'all stay with her? Like how was, it's, I would imagine, and we can get into this, I'm sure for you, there was some survivor's guilt. You were grieving. You had just gone through something that most people never experience. So extreme trauma. You had lost someone that you contemplated marrying had you gotten out of this. And then you have Tanya, who's lost her travel buddy, good friend. How did y'all even have a conversation or did you after that? What was that like? So Tanya's story, the best I can tell it is, um, so she just handled things a lot differently than Tina, Mm -hmm. even Mm -hmm. from the fact of when we were missing, um, Tina was just on a mission, you know, again, she knew I wasn't going to leave her. She knew something happened. I think Tanya was just really struggling with, yeah, being in a foreign country, not having Larry there, wondering Mm -hmm. what was happening. Um, Mm -hmm. And so she chose to just kind of, um, I think she panicked a little bit more and just, she handled things a little differently naturally because, I mean, that was a crazy position to be in in the first place and a lot of stress and um, trauma that that can create, Mm -hmm. but they handled things differently. And I do think, and then later when technically I was found and Larry wasn't, um, you know, she, she withdrew um, Mm -hmm. quite a bit. Is again mm-hmm. understandable, um, but I believe I think that she had a lot of resentment towards me, 
And mm-hmm. so I wasn't with her very often. She was with Tina, of course, most of the time. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think we did our best um, to be there for each other. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but I just, I, um, I just, she just had a, you know, it was a tragic experience for her. Yeah, so. for sure. And, and I can understand it would be normal for somebody to be angry at the person who survived, you know, mm-hmm. in, not in place of their friend, but she lost her friend. Yeah. And that's hard. Uh, un- yeah, absolutely. Hard. Um, okay. So then how long, so then you reconcile with Tina, I'm sorry. Yes. Tina. And then when do you go back home? A week later, <clears throat> Tina and I decided to um, stay in Corfu because we had to, um, Larry's parents came. His mom came from Austin, Texas. His mm-hmm. dad and stepmom were living in Germany at the time. They flew in to Corfu uh, to meet me as well as assist um, with the port authorities in trying to locate Larry. So we spent two days with them, going through things, meeting with them. Um, his dad was so supportive of me um, in this situation, especially of losing his only son. Um, his mom was also engaging with me, but she was also very, um, uh, you know, stoic in, in a part and also pretty angry and understandably. And um she just handled things again as different. She was just a little um, not as welcoming at the time um, as um, his dad was. But we had to go through all that. And we also had to deal with the port authority and the police. So after all that was done, Tina and I went to the other side of the island to just decompress and figure out what the hell just happened mm-hmm. for us. Oh my gosh. So like, and we were there about a week. Time of decompression. <laughs> Like not just a couple of days, but so that leads to the next question. So you go back home, you're re-enrolled in college. At, yep. As a Washington senior. State. Okay. Yep. It's my senior year. I'm supposed to go back. Um, well, now our trip was cut drastically short. We were not able to pack back the remainder of the summer. Um, but we came home um, to a lot of media, a lot of media mm-hmm. frenzy. Um, the... Associated Press had picked up the story and it made national news, international news. Um, The Oprah Winfrey show called and invited me to be a guest on their show. Um, Did that and then which happened in the summer and then we started the fall year. um, And things I think it finally started settling in and uh, things were very chaotic and I was not handling my emotions very well at all. It was, everything was just really settling in. By the time I did get to school, I mean, I was in a complete depression, a bad funk, if you will. I was uh, drinking a lot to try to numb my pain. Um, I had a terrible case of insomnia. I was failing my classes. Can I ask Um, you about that insomnia real fast? mm -hmm. I just can imagine that anytime you closed your eyes, what did you see? I mean, I would think sleeping would be almost impossible but it was. given you had just experienced. And then just anytime you weren't busy doing something, all those thoughts and all those emotions just flooded your system again. So what were, do you mind sharing? Like, what were some of those? Did you see Larry? Did you see yourself falling? Did you see yourself floating in the ocean? What, what were some of those reoccurring thoughts and visuals that you had? I had a reoccurring nightmare. I mean, all the time. Um, that was really what was preventing my sleep because every mm-hmm. time I closed my eyes, I had the feeling of falling overboard and I would wake mm-hmm. up, you know, with that, that shock mm-hmm. and it would always wake me up out of my sleep. Um, so that got me, um, I would relive kind of the moment when Larry and I separated. Um, I, always felt this strange um i kind of would have nightmares about <clears throat> what truly lurked beneath the surface mm-hmm. uh, what was under the water um we had learned at one time that there were actually submarines that were oh in there in the water at one point and um i just kept having this vision of 
like a submarine passing under me and then deciding to ascend. And I just, that always woke me up sweating and crying out of my Mm -hmm. sleep. So, um, that was not, yeah, that was a very, that was the most difficult, um, period of my life. Absolutely. But that point. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, so it was the insomnia. Those are my visions that I had and the survivor's guilt. It was all of it. So, Mm -hmm. so I was definitely not going down a very good path. Mm -hmm. And, um, finally, uh, a couple months into school, um, now just, you know, feeling unworthy and, um, just not doing well. Right. It had all been building up again. I was failing everything I was doing. I felt like, um, finally I, my dad encouraged me to finally go get help. Um, he was very well aware of these signs, um, which would technically nowadays be PTSD, but it wasn't referred to it as back then. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but he basically encouraged me to get counseling. It had never dawned on me to get help. And, um, so I was grateful. It's just not mainstream back then. <laughs> it wasn't like, talked about like it is. So. <laughs> no, I didn't really, really think of that as being an option. So, wow. um, but I am so grateful that I did because that man, my counselor literally changed my life. Mm. Um, within only a few sessions, um, I was able to understand what was going on. I was, um, I realized that it was more normal um, when you do have a traumatic experience. Um, you do go through certain stages and that is all part of healing. And I was able to name everything. And so that gave me um, a lot of help to be aware when I was um, experiencing negativity. It really uh, made me, um, it, he gave me a permission to um, like, it was okay to mm-hmm. grieve and to not always have to be so strong and that it did happen. And, um, but he also, it gave me hope because what it learned, what I learned from our time together was, um, you know, I kept focusing on the negatives and obviously because it was extremely tragic what happened to Larry, but I realized, I mean, I wasn't doing well and I had, um, I realized that, and I wanted to honor Larry, but I realized in order to honor his death, you know, I had to live. Mm. And I was given this beautiful gift of living and I was not doing that at all. And so I had to change, you know, my thought process and stop focusing on all the bad things and all the negatives and really focus more on the blessings and the silver lines, silver Mm -hmm. linings that I had, my friends and friendships. Well, so you just said something that is, I think, one of the biggest takeaways next to just follow your intuition in parenting, which is in order to honor his death, I had to live. That is so profound and so true and really does allow us, we can, if we can have that little mindset shift when we do experience the loss of people that we love to recognize, like it, it just allows us to live out their legacy that much more and to honor to your point, their life and who they were when we are living our lives, life to the fullest, it doesn't help anybody. It doesn't help the lot. It doesn't help the world, your family, your friends, your community. If, if you're withdrawn and I'm not, don't mean to demean that and like, Oh, it's just easy to go into like, I'm just going to honor the, like it took a lot of practice in counseling mm-hmm. and coaching for you. So I love that. That is so strong. So I'm sure when you met up with him, your counselor or your therapist was, he's like, I've heard about you. I've been waiting for this phone call. <laughs> Thank God he said that. Story? So as I mentioned, it made, it, basically it felt like the entire university knew about my story, which a lot of them did because again, it, at that point, that's how you communicated. You know, essentially the story had gone viral, just not in the way it does today. Um, Mm -hmm. but when I finally did pick up the phone to call him, um, Mm -hmm. when I finally got to him, um, I introduced myself and he basically said, um, I know who you are. I know your story and I've been waiting for you to call. And I just, (laughs) like, thank you. Place. Oh my gosh. And it I, was the same. I know yeah. At this time, everybody watched Oprah. There was only one newspaper, and I'm sure, like, it was, yeah. I mean, I think anybody in today's world would also, but would also recognize it would be a huge story. It would be major national news, but we didn't have all the distractions 
um, in 1991 mm -hmm. that we have now to peel us off of the story. So I'm, I'm sure you love being the center of attention too. Did you, and did you have friends who didn't understand? Like, were they like, just snap out of it, Simone? Or was everybody pretty understanding of your withdrawal and your, and, and just your, how you were living through your trauma? I feel, I mean, I've always, um, you know, kind of going to the power of we, Mm -hmm. I feel I've always been very blessed with my friendships. Um, I genuinely try to nurture them. Um, they're very important to me. So for the most part, I always had support. Um, mm -hmm. Now, whether I took it or not was a different story. But um, overall, it was I it was very supportive. Um, I, it did. Yeah, the intention was interesting. Sometimes I enjoyed it. And then sometimes I didn't so much. Sometimes things were awkward. And sometimes people didn't know exactly what to say to me, mm -hmm. because there's a beautiful side of the survival story aspect. But then when you follow it also with a tragic loss, loss, it just mm -hmm. makes things sometimes a little awkward and people just don't really know how to handle that. So yeah, but I totally. overall, yeah, people didn't weren't judging me. <laughs> I don't think. <laughs> Well, they that's probably, good. they could have been, but no, I didn't feel it. <laughs> no, they were like, Shh, can you believe she, that's that girl that survived. Um, that was what always about, what I was known as. The, that, aren't you that one that fell over <laughs> off the ferry? Aren't you that girl that fell off the boat? Yes, I am. Like, hi, I'm Simone. <laughs> First and when they fell I'm, off the boat. Yes. Um, and then did you graduate there pretty, pretty soon thereafter? Um, again, yeah, again, thank you to my wonderful counseling. Um, and, you know, and really, um, I do joke about joke, but not joke, but I'm like, it, the, because of the grace of God, essentially, somehow yeah. I turned things around and I started passing my classes. I started going to school again and I graduated on time. And so, um, <laughs> yeah, so I had to, you, you know, kick everybody the, for I, any college student out there listening, you too, you can have setbacks, That's but right. you too, uh, That's you too can right. pass. So for sure. Oh my gosh. Okay. Thank you for sharing that. We're going to, we're going to go get for... into some more. Yeah. That's, I mean, I, you shared more. I've heard your story many times. Cause like I said earlier, I always put you on the spot in front of other people. Like, yo, got a nice story. <laughs> but I got even more out of it today. Aww. And wow, you're so remarkable. And I appreciate you just your, your candidness, your willingness to just com be completely honest and share these you know, not these hard memories, these really hard memories. Um, did you well, thank ever you for your support yeah, on that too. 100%. Did you ever um, connect with Larry's mom? Did you ever see her in Austin when you ended up being back in Austin or moving to Austin, ironically? Was that weird for you? You're like, oh my gosh, this is where Larry, was he from Austin? Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. He grew up in Austin. Um, not in, um, what's the, oh. In his middle schools, um, it was closer to Denton where he, I think he went to middle school, but he lived in oh. Austin though for school and his mom okay. was here when he was in college. Um, so Larry's mom, um, so again, she was, she was very stern, very stoic, um, tried to be loving, but also was very guarded and reserved mm -hmm. again, naturally. Um, I didn't necessarily, of course, understand at the time, right, of just, um, of course, I knew she would be a grieving mother. Um, mm -hmm. But everything changes when you are an actual mother, because mm -hmm. you will totally. never be able to fathom what that could possibly entail. I certainly did not know that at 21 years old. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. She, um, when I got back um, to Seattle, we would have phone conversations and, um, but they got harder because she was starting to grieve. But our last phone conversation that we had, she asked me what well, she was explaining that she had been cleaning out the closets and was putting away, um, the baby clothes that she had saved for Larry's when he had his children. And then basically she asked me, you know, what is she supposed to do with those now? And I, um, I, I couldn't handle it. I couldn't be there for her anymore because I was going through my own. Um, process and mm -hmm. grief. Mm -hmm. And so sadly, that was the last phone conversation. Um, that was the last time we'd ever had a conversation. I basically had to separate from that. Did and I never. To no. Did she ever try to reach back out to you or did you tell her, you know, I don't think I can do this anymore. This is just too hard. 
At that time I did. And um, again, so she pops into my mind though um, at times and has since I've had children because Mm -hmm. now as a mother, I mean, Mm -hmm. you know, we won't go down that path, but I mean, Mm -hmm. you can't, I, I, and I have sons. Um, Mm -hmm. I cannot even fathom. I I can't fathom. And it would make so much sense why she would want to hang on to you Mm -hmm. and even like being the last person who saw her son and shared um, not just, you know, his last moments, but very intimate, difficult last moments. Um, And that's really what they wanted. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what what they wanted from me, right? To hear Mm -hmm. those Mm -hmm. last moments and somebody that he did find, um, you know, possibly worthy of love. So Mm -hmm. it was, Mm -hmm. Um, but, and I, and I've thought about reaching out to her. Um, but I was advised not to because who would know what state that could put, bring her back for her. Maybe if I came back in the picture, both of, both of us. Um, and yeah. I really, you know, I think I'm pretty easy. I, you can find me kind of easily, I feel like. And so I feel, or at least this is what the information I was guided at and I'm going to take it. But if she really wanted to find me, I think she could find me. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, because I wouldn't want to do anything negative for her again. I mean, I would, it would kill me yeah, and crush me to bring anything negative back up for her. And sometimes in order to move on, you have to be able to make a break, you know, in a mm-hmm. relationship. If that, if being in that relationship is impairing one or both of your ability, ability to heal. Um, Mm -hmm. so I totally understand that. Um, how did your parents, how, I mean, if I would like to think I would encourage my children, like, Hey, you go out there and get them. But the real, the realistic part of me would be like, don't you ever lose my, leave my sight again. And no, you're never going to travel again. And no, you're not going to go to school in another state, even though I know you lived in Seattle, but, uh, and that's where you're from. But how did your parents ever let you out of their sight again? I know it's a different age, a different age, you know? I mean, it really is. I mean, we didn't have the communication. There was a lot of independence. I came from, I am the product of two very strong-willed parents. And that's just what you did. (laughs) I mean, you just, Mm -hmm. you know, so um, I, I was, I I was always loved and Mm -hmm. never, ever questioned that. I was always supported, but I was very independent. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times I took on the role kind of even with my mom, like I kind of took on a parenting role at times. Mm -hmm. So um, my parents essentially were obviously devastated here in the news. um, And they actually wanted to come to Greece and help. And I literally persuaded and encouraged them not to come because I had to take care of my business and help everyone else out. And I didn't want to have to feel like I had to take care of them as well. That was what I put on my head as to why. Uh-huh. So, and I am because pretty persuasive. you were the only child of your Abs- parents. I was, yes. yes. I do have, of those two, of my dad and my mom, yes. yes. Um, I have two beautiful, sweet half-sisters um, from my dad's second marriage, but um, who I love and grew up with. But um, yes, but anyway, but they did not come to Greece. And I laugh my, you know what, off about that now because if my children, if this ever happened to my children, I would have been on the first flight out there. I mean, it would not have been yeah. an option. So anyway, well, and, different and, times. And it, it wasn't an option really, right? And they're like, well, Simone's going to take care of it. She always takes care of it. We know she's mm-hmm. alive. She's out of the hospital. Mm-hmm. All is good. It is she's just fine. a completely different world and mindset that we yep. parent with now versus when we were growing up. And I really love that your parents were so like, okay, well, she's got okay, that's good. So, <laughs> but again, I never doubted that they didn't love me or anything, but they were like, okay, well, we'll see you in a not. week. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Be safe. Don't get on a ferry again. And whatever you do, don't get put up on top of a railing. <laughs> oh, <laughs> wow. Um, I would have loved to have met your mom and dad. I know your mom is tasked. Your dad's still living. He is absolutely. And, um, we've just gotten closer and closer over the years and my stepmom too. And so uh, well, I was always close with them, but he's just really been taking that grandfather role and yeah. he, oh. yeah, I see him quite a bit. There's nothing better. Okay. So 
Here is you, Simone has, as a result of her story, she's writing a book. And oh, the book, be yes. The next part, the book that we're all going to buy. And as a matter of fact, um, last night I was telling Melaine, my nine year old, about our podcast. And she's like, oh, you better get me that book. <laughs> So I Aww. just would like to go ahead and um, request an autographed uh, signed book from Elaine. Of course, I will pay for it, but she is requesting <laughs> one. And of course, I want one of my own as well. And I plan to give it to many others. Um, You're okay, sweet. But before You're always supportive. That part, uh, how, your, your husband, Sean. You have a book or you have a story that you're telling about you falling off of a ferry with a man that you were like very, very um, head over heels with. And now you're writing a book about that and your book is going to explode. And then you're going to be telling this story to everyone. I just put Russell in Sean's shoes and I think Russell would be supportive, but I also think he would be uncomfortable with me sharing a story um, about, you know, me and another man. Again, he would support would override. Um, so how does Sean handle this when it really is that way i think in the i think the issue technically is because yes there's a there's a story it's my story um mm -hmm. but yeah there's another man involved and so um when we were dating and i first told him the story um you know of course well it, it wasn't like there was an overload of emotions which i think at first i was kind of like huh oh, okay well that's <laughs> interesting to me <laughs> you know because it had been like this beer going okay so she fell off the boat okay and she survived it's kind of the way i was like oh, is that oh, that's all i get okay you know here i'm like trying to impress them maybe i don't know at the time we were still in courtship um so anyway but i did you know basically acknowledge the fact that yeah we are talking about i mean if we're talking about love for each other and yet I'm still, I, you know, had this person that I was also in love with that, even though it was a very brief period of time. Um, but of course, you know, Larry and I never had stood the test of time. So it was a different thing. And, um, but yeah, but Sean though is absolutely supportive of my story. It's not necessarily in the way that I was expecting it to be, because really that's for my girlfriends to be not my husband. So Got he's it. supportive for me for giving me the gift of time and financially that I don't have that burden on me right now that I can devote my time to trying to finish this book, which has taken a lot longer than I was anticipating. I love that you recognize uh, that that's the gift he's giving you, that he's able to do that. Um, and that's the way he shows his support. It may not come through with like all this enthusiasm, but he's definitely giving you the time, the space and the resources to set a time mm -hmm. well, to, to write this book and to tell your story. I love that. I'm very um, appreciative. I'm grateful. Yeah. How about your children? Are they like, oh, mom's telling her story again. She fell off a boat, blah, blah, blah. Or is pretty it much. Yeah. <laughs> um, once in a while, when they were younger, it was kind of that like, oh, yeah, I don't know. She fell off this boat or something. Like they just had no, when people would ask them, um, they really, yeah, just did not understand what was going on. Now they've gotten a little older. And then if I say I'm writing a book or um, I've gotten to um, share my story um, at some events and, um, you know, and then if you say something about social media or something like that, you know, that piques my daughter going, hmm, maybe there's something to this story. I don't know. And so, um, yeah, they, I don't know that. And I, I didn't share it for quite a while with them when they were younger. They just wouldn't have understood. So. Um, Sometimes I think they appreciate it. And then sometimes I feel like I feel like I'm a broken record. They look at me like I'm just talking again, like a broken record. So <laughs> no. but they're supportive. It must be a mom thing because I get that same stare. Yeah. There like, what do you do? Yeah. Um, my son, actually, this is this is this is this might clear it up. I was invited at one point in the middle school to uh, for career day, be a speaker at career day on book writing or inspirational okay. speaking. Mm -hmm. And my son, I told him, I wanted to ask him, I said, Hey, I've been invited to speak there. Are you okay with that? You know, are you gonna have a problem with that? And he basically was like, yeah, but like, what are you going to talk about? Like, what? <laughs> I was like, Bye. Oh, that's my reality check right there. Mom so, yeah. inspiring. What? <laughs> 
<laughs> oh my gosh, that's so great. And that's why children keep us grounded. That's part of their part of their gift to us. They just, <laughs> just keep us on real giving. humble and real grounded. Okay, let's talk about your book. Um, have you settled on a title? I know you've that's a big deal. So I know it's probably gone back and forth. It is a big deal. And I mean, the title will always be a work in progress, depending on if someone, if or when someone picks it up. So, Mm -hmm. um, but it's always been called Adriatic. Um, It's easy to remember. It's just, I've referenced it since 1991, Adriatic. So Mm -hmm. the subtitles have been anything from uh, the ripple of effect of a miracle at sea. Um, It's been a true story of love, loss and survival and learning to live again. Um, It's been uh, something about hope and floating in the water or Mm -hmm. being in the water for over 18 hours and hope was the only real life raft. So I don't know what's going to (laughs) happen. Okay. So then this is a perfect question to how has the writing process been? Oof. I know you said, Um, well, it's been harder than you anticipated. I can only imagine. And you've been really committed to this. I have. I mean, it's something I will absolutely finish. It's definitely taken a lot longer than I thought. Um, I really was never a writer. That wasn't what my strengths technically were. So um, why, how I'm writing this book, um, I probably should have gotten more help along the way, but I've been blessed. I have gotten some help. Um, well, you just but don't think- know what you don't know. You know, you learn <laughs> yeah. along through the process. Like it's really and hard you- to write. Yeah. It's, uh, but I, but I've been fortunate, but the interesting thing is it's literally probably on the third, really, really hard rewrite and Mm -hmm. it just gets better. And it's for the purpose it's supposed to serve. I just, I'm feeling a lot more, um, that it's, it's so close. It's so close, but it is, it's a better, um, story. And I feel like it will serve the purpose you'd mentioned before. It's, it's definitely a unique story um but it's universal emotions it's universal themes mm-hmm, mm-hmm. for sure i apologize yeah. it might think he's falling out of my sorry no you're yeah. good no you're, you're so, right right not many people have fallen off of a boat before and been stranded in the adriatic sea or the any body of water for like that and survived to tell about it but you're right those emotions are something that we all experience throughout life which is remarkable that we get to experience these things together, that not one of us are unique in that way and that there's somebody who can, who can lift us up through their experience um, and share their, their encouragement and their ability to survive and their hope. So, um, so when in the right, in the book writing process, were there things that you remembered as, as a result of having to, as a result of writing it down that you had forgotten and just like, the storytelling part of it to other people? Yes, it just, um, the writing process is very interesting in and of itself. And as the years have gone by, my appreciation towards it is just, it's really fascinating. And when someone is truly a good, exceptional writer, I mean, mm. that's a gift. And, mm. um, you know, that's something that, I mean, my, my, my book, which will, you know, hopefully serve its purpose is not going to be like a literary masterpiece. And I'm okay with that. So I appreciate the ones that can write that way. But through the process, there's plenty um, of those, by the way, we don't need more literary masterpieces. (laughs) I don't think (laughs) we Um, want to know the real Simone. (laughs) Yeah, well, and you'll get that. Um, But the interesting thing is, yeah, I'm more of a kind of a direct sort of bottom line kind of person. So when you try to write more in a narrative aspect and have to bring all the feelings, like Mm -hmm. that's challenging to me. So um, but I have in the process of writing everything down. Yes. Sometimes you just start writing and you don't know where it's coming from. And then, yes, that makes you pause and go, huh. Oh, that's interesting. I forgot about that. So when you were seeing your, your therapist or your counselor in college, did he uh, encourage you to write to journal? So I don't feel that journaling at that time was as free flowing as we talk about it today. However, yeah. so no, he did not tell me to do that. But Tina was the one that had the journal and encouraged me to journal. So it was Tina. She's so smart and wise. I know. I'm very lucky to have her. 
way back when it wasn't even a, a you know, mm-hmm. a recommendation for processing emotions and being mm-hmm. able to get things out of your body. Um, so do you feel like that you have been able to process this even more in the writing since you've written the book? Sure. Um, I think it puts things in perspective. Um, it's a constant reminder of my gratitude. Um, it's a, it's a reminder of, you know, we can overcome hard things. Um, so yeah, I'm just, I'm grateful for the process and yeah. Yeah, I can see that. Um, what's the one thing you've enjoyed most about writing your book? And you can again, I think, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's this, it, again, it's kind of just the reminder. I think that um, because I've worked really hard and being authentic with my story and the emotions and all the things um, when, and then I do have support that um, help me what, if they're reading a particular thing I've been struggling with or working on to try to make sure I'm getting it in the right way. Um, and if it brings out, if it elicits their emotions, um, that's very rewarding to me because then I mm-hmm. feel like it's serving its purpose. Mm, for sure. Um, for someone considering writing a book, What's at least one piece of book writing wisdom or advice you can give them? Oh, man, absolutely. Um, To get a group like a writer's group, either create one of your own or join one. Hands down. Um, I have a. That means you're in one. And how long have you been in it? And how often do you meet? We started it six years ago. And. it's because of them is why I started the book and or why they gave me the opportunity to start writing the book. And we only wrote on Tuesdays. So that had to be nice to just um, say, okay, I, my book day is Tuesdays. Is that how you did it then? You just, yep. you Tuesdays, just wrote that. every Tuesday for, we did that for four years. Um, wow. I, ha- I hate that I'm doing it. Um, I need to turn on the power source. One second. Hold yeah, on. go for it. Hold on. I'm so sorry. <laughs> happens to all of us. I just had to check my battery too. Um, oh my God. The thing is yeah. flashing up. Battery back. I'm like, oh, oh my God. That was being so bad if it sorry. powered out on us. Yeah. Um, but we're good. Okay. So sorry to ask this question, but I have to. Do you have a completion date in mind? So I've blown all the completion dates that I've had in my mind. So. Mm-hmm. Uh, yes, I think, I mean, it's so close. I'm so close. I'm finishing up this, basically this very last, um, editing efforts. Um, Mm -hmm. I really am trying to get that done before Christmas so that starting in January, it will be ready to, um, try to find an agent and a publicist if that's the case, unless I have to self publish. Have you been given information on what that process is like and how you even start that? Yes, I think I've got some great contacts and basically in January, I'll just start following up from everyone who has been kind enough to suggest somebody. Um, I'll start doing all my following up on that, but it's not an easy process and it's, it could be difficult to find an agent that, you know, is that right fit for you? And that's what I'm just going to be careful on. Okay. So then just for purchasing, for just for the, pro- the, the act of purchasing, Maybe this time next year, assuming all were to go smoothly, we'll have your book to buy and give it for well, Christmas present. Um, that is what a friend of mine and I were just talking about the other day. Oh, and I'm going to say it. yes, Nisa. The the okay. goal would be like in starting, you know, November that I had something to basically be able to get out. Yeah, for the Christmas holidays. I think that would be super mm-hmm. fabulous. We'll have another podcast. We'll have a book publishing podcast party. Uh, the, we'll I mean, the day. That. Yeah. The day that I get to, yeah, tell you that um, will be a very fantastic day. Oh my gosh, that is so exciting! I cannot wait. I cannot wait. Okay, so now we're going to talk about real fast. We have just a couple more questions, and then we're going to go rapid fire. So Simone, as I said earlier at the very beginning, she's been part of Ignite since two thousand and nine, and because you're a very busy mom turned author. You have a life outside of just exercise every day. Um, your participation as far as how many days a, uh, days a week that you're able to participate has ebbed and flowed just based on kids' schedules and, you know, school drop-offs and all that stuff. But as of late, 
um, the last six weeks, you have taken it to another level. You're like gangbusters. Simone is, uh, we, she accepted the a challenge that we offered out called the get it girl challenge, 30 classes in seven weeks, um, to end right before Thanksgiving. And you have, you're like five days a week right now. And it was, um, brought to me that you said something of the, um, of the, like you said something like, wow, I never thought I could commit to five days a week of exercise like this, but I'm doing it and I feel so good. So I'm just curious, there is a mindset shift in there somewhere. And as you and I know, both agree, mindset is everything. Clearly, it's one of the things that got you over. It allowed you to uh, survive in the sea the way you did and then overcome such trauma and and grief. And so what would you say, um, what was the mindset shift for you in with this now being committed to five days a week of exercise? How did you, what happened? And it was a shift. Um, I feel like when you sent out the challenge, which you were always so good about inspiring us to do challenges and get us out of our comfort zone. So I love that. Um, but because literally when you sent it out, my first initial <clears throat> thought was, that's too hard. Um, I don't have time for that. I can't, if I were to do it, I would have to work out at least five days a week in order to achieve that. Um, I didn't achieve the last challenge that you had set out. So I had all the excuses mm-hmm. to not do it. And, um, and then because of some friendly, a friendly nudge. And I think you even sent out something like, you know, come on girls, you got this. And, and then I don't know really what happened, but basically one of your other awesome well, I think Rebecca leaders said, yep. come on girl, you're a challenge girl. You got this. Yep. She did. And like her email and tech just came kind of at that right nudge. And she was kind of right. calling me out, but in a great <laughs> loving, friendly way of you like challenges. Why is your name not on this list? Yeah. And I just really had that epiphany of like, Oh, wait a second. I do love challenges. And that is why this is hard because it's a challenge. And yeah. I just decided, you know what, I'm, I'm going to do this. And it was a shift of my mindset. And I appreciated her little gentle nudge. Yeah, totally. Well, okay. Do you have a strategy? What have you, what have you had to change in order? Because I think what you experience is so common for most everybody, which is, um, the first thought isn't, Oh, let me figure out how to do this because it would be really great if I committed to fit to exercise five days a week, that'd be really good. I feel really good about that instead of like, no, I just can't do it. So what, what was, what is your strategy? How did, how did you make, how did you make it work? Well, I realized that I had to have a plan, which was to meet your number. I really would have had to have worked out five days a week. And Mm -hmm. then I figured, okay, things do come up sometimes. So if I wasn't able to make, I prefer those outdoor classes that Mm -hmm. you have. I love them. Um, But if I couldn't make one of those times in the morning, then I knew I would have the opportunity to go in one of your video libraries or catch one of your classes so that I could ensure that I had that workout done in that given day, even if it wasn't at the original time I'd anticipated. Mm -hmm. So I just Mm -hmm. made the commitment that I had to do it five days out of a Mm -hmm. week. And, Mm -hmm. um, I had to plan a little bit ahead. Um, I'm not a huge planner sometimes. And I just had to, even I didn't have to do it, you know, a week in advance because I'm not good in that regard. But, you know, the night before, I would just have to kind of get all my ducks in a row, make sure yeah. my daughter's rides are covered and whatnot. And I just had to plan around it. And doesn't, doesn't that feel good? Like mm-hmm. the structure in your brain feels really good to know that you're like, it's not to say that the day is going to go exactly as you had planned. Right. But you have a map and this is the, and I, I love to pride myself with my spontaneity, but something happened during COVID where, you know, everything was going haywire and we had to shift to online that I cannot, I have to have a plan now. And I feel so non-creative and those non, so non-spontaneous now because I need a plan in order to execute. I I cannot fly by the seat of my pants effectively anymore. Mm. And maybe it's my age too. You know, my eyesight's going. Maybe my my spot and eighties going too. But uh, but it feels so good to have 
a plan. And I think for anything, whether it be a book, right, whatever your goal is, you have to have a plan. And the way you start the day, it, it really does um, have an effect on your entire day. So to this, to that kind of point, do you notice a difference in how you feel in body mm. and mind and in spirit? Absolutely. Um, I mean, I'm still, it's always a challenge for me from a nutritional standpoint and hormone balancing and whatnot. But from the physical aspect of doing your classes, mm-hmm. absolutely. My body feels better. My mind feels better spiritually. Spirit feels better. So mm-hmm. yeah, I absolutely notice a difference and it feels so good. That was what I was telling Alice. <laughs> I just, mm-hmm. yeah, and it feels so good. I'm like, why, why are, why do we not do this all the time? And so yeah, yeah. Um, let's take it week by week. But yeah, no, I'm so grateful for the way I feel right now. Uh, well, you look incredible. You always do. You're just a gorgeous specimen, uh-huh. but you do have a glow about you. Um, and yeah, it is such a great reminder that even if we've been doing something a certain way for all these years, we can change, change, we can adapt, we can do more. Um, and it's okay to, to care for yourself. That many Absolutely. Days yeah, Absolutely. Like that. Well, thank you for that. And then when you're not igniting, five days a week and you're not momming and wifing and being an author, what can we find you doing? I would say definitely traveling um, and nurturing my friendships, um, my lunches. I, again, I'd mentioned that before. They're very important to me. And um, so traveling and so if I get to travel and also be with my friends, even though my family trips are fantastic, but you know, a girlfriend travel um, Mm -hmm. and it is, probably one of the most amazing things I think. And actually I'm just going to say, um, my sorority sisters, there's nine of us. Um, oh, we've been goodness. doing a girl's trip, an annual girl's trip for 28 years. So I look wow. forward to that and I've, we've been consistent and that's what you would find me doing. Nine of you. Not all nine always go. It, that number varies, well, but there's a group of us. Of somebody when they can't <laughs> Can I it's be the a best. doctor? A friend <laughs> oh, wow. That is such a, that is beautiful that y'all are committed yeah. to one another, to um, your friendship and to just getting away like that, which leads me, I mean, perfect segue into you are going on a trip in January. So in Ignite, we have an annual Renew Year retreat in San Diego. It's every January. And Simone was on the very first one that we mm-hmm. had and almost seven years ago. And you are signed up to go on this next one in January. Mm-hmm. And as a woman, as a wife, as a mom, uh, it, you know, to go exercise, to commit to myself exercise wise is one thing, but to give myself the gift of a retreat and going somewhere where I'm going to be cared for and nurtured and my family's going to have to figure it out, you know, how, how did you manage that? Because this is really, that is really hard to give yourself permission to do something that feels mm. so luxurious. So oh, how, did yes. you do, how did you do this? Well, it goes back to, it's got to be a priority. And mm. um, I am also, again, very blessed to have a very supportive family. Um, mm-hmm. So um, Sean is pretty used to the fact, again, I've done these girls trips for 28 years, as well as my Lost Creek besties too mm-hmm. of my friends that we do our trips. So he's used to the fact that, um, and he supports the fact that, um, I get to do things like that, which makes me thrive. So mm-hmm. I feel like I'm really lucky in that regard, but it does take planning and the priority prioritizing myself over it. Um, I also think the consistency of it, you, you hold them in January. And so therefore we know about it. And, um, and, uh, it's an amazing trip, obviously, which is why I continue to go. And so, um, but I think it's just, you have to realize how important it is and do that for yourself. Well, don't you think too, I think sometimes we just automatically kind of like, no, I can't exercise five days a week. I can't commit to five days a week worth of it. First of all, we, we have to be open to the possibility of it, but I think a, a common female trait, negative trait is we don't even ask, right? And it, like mm-hmm. we don't even bring it up to our husband, like, Hey, I really want to go do this thing mm-hmm. because it's important to me. And I just need to get away and I need to n- be nourished and I need to laugh. And I just need a break from 
all of this, all of you, <laughs> and all of my responsibility of being a wife and a mom and a professional and author. Um, and so sometimes I just think if we would ask, mm. we would the answer would be yes, a whole lot more. And that could be for any and everything, not just you know, a retreat. That is pretty luxurious, but it could be for anything. And it sounds like, but you also set the precedent pretty early on with Sean. Um, well, I did. And, and I agree. It is asking. And it, it's kind of that thing too of, you know, even before your challenge, like you kind of have that natural knee jerk excuse to be like, oh, I can't do that. And, mm -hmm. um, I, and I'm not afraid to ask about things mm -hmm. usually. So, um, absolutely. Um, you do have to ask and you have to see the value in it and how important it is. And I mean, who would ever regret going on, you know, a trip or something for yourself, right? No one does it because they're all, yeah, awesome. there's never any regrets. It's like, <laughs> there's also never any regrets about exercising. We always feel no. better afterwards, yeah. but it's this weird kind of mindset shift and psychology thing about uh, the things we allow ourselves to, um, experience and have. Um, and I was going to say something else about that. And I also know as being a mom, like you're just, you're a good stage in that your kids aren't little bitty. Cause when they're little bitty, it's really hard to get Absolutely. away. And when they get older, they're, they're busier, but you still have to kind of manage all of those things. And would you agree with me that I feel like sometimes what holds women, ba women back, from doing, from saying yes to certain things is just the logistical mm -hmm. preparation of it all, writing the schedule down, getting rides set up. But what, that's the hardest part to any kind of getaway is like the front end of it. Once you get all that stuff taken care of and get on that airplane, never look back. I, I, well, absolutely. Logistics and planning ahead. It's all very difficult. I will say this though. And again, and I'm saying this based on the fact that I had 20, I've had 28 consecutive years of a girl's trip. Um, yes. In the beginning, I was, I brought in all the troops. I had everyone there to take care of the kids. I had the refrigerator stocked. I did all the laundry. I went grocery shopping. I had the full list. I had all the play groups set up. I had all the carpools and everything set up. Um, and then I realized like, it usually nine times out of 10, most of that didn't happen when I went away. The food was always still in the refrigerator. The totally. Half the, out every time. Half oh, the, my gosh. Half the play yeah. dates didn't happen. Half the games got missed. And then I realized, so what? <laughs> it's not going to happen the way I did. But they had a great weekend with their dad, right? Totally. And, and again, I'm blessed. I have a spouse that, you know, would do that. Um, but then I, so then I stopped planning it so hard. I stopped taking mm -hmm. care of all that. And then really my only goal for him was when I come home, I just want my whole family together. Like I just want everyone alive. That's, uh -huh. that's the bare minimum. And, <laughs> and anything else, you know, it's, yeah. it's just, it's okay. Totally. So. And you know what? I do think we do love to control. That is mm -hmm. our opportunity as mamas is like, if you, it, it's going to look different. If you want to yep. get away, you got to let dad do whatever dad's going to do. The goal is to keep them alive. Bottom line, who cares if they eat donuts for every single meal? Right? Doesn't like, matter. I've had that conversation with Russell. I'm like, really? Donuts every morning before school? I'm like, shut up. It doesn't matter. Doesn't They're matter. Alive. I got and to it, go do my thing. He supported it. Well, and I mean, quite frankly, they have, they've done some really incredible things while I've been gone. Which <laughs> kind of sucks, but also it's like, yeah, okay. they don't have me there telling them how they need to probably do it right. Me, I am yeah. a controlling person, I, you know, so they got to have their freedom and they had made some great memories and, you know, they wouldn't have probably done that had I probably been there and that, you know, that's a good and a bad thing, I guess, but they need, they need to. They do not be doing it the way I expect them to do it or something. <laughs> I love this so much. You know, my sister gave me really fantastic wisdom. She's four years older than me and she had two kids before me, which I'm so glad because she's paved the way and I get to mm -hmm. kind of um, just be in her back wind and, and do what she does. But um, she said one time when we first had had children, she said, if you want Russell, if you want Russell to help you, you need to, and this was wisdom. It wasn't like she had seen me, thankfully, being controlling because I didn't know what the heck I was doing either. But we do have a maternal instinct, you know, that men just don't necessarily. And I know Russell was holding the baby like, what do I do now? You know, but um, 
She said, if you want him to be involved, you have to involve him and mm-hmm. then step away. So let him feed the baby, let him change mm-hmm. the diaper and don't micromanage him while he's doing it. Let him show him and then step away. And that yep. was like the best advice. Cause if not, you just end up really hurting yourself in the long run because then there's another kid and another or more responsibility. And then you're stuck with all of it and you're resentful because you haven't, because mm-hmm. your husband's mm-hmm. not involved, but you've kind of never given him permission to be mm-hmm. involved. So it's true. anyway, okay. Rapid fire question time. Best okay. wisdom or advice you've ever received. Oh, okay. I, Oh, I, okay, I do. This is the best advice I think I've ever received. So I may or may not have been complaining about something. Um, could have been life, kids, marriage. I don't know. But what I remember saying at the one point was basically like, well, you know, the grass is probably greener on the other side. Something to that effect, right? But what my friend said was she had heard a quote that basically said, actually, the grass is greener when you water it. Ugh. And I was like, Oh, <laughs> Oh. And I remember, and I was like, Oh my God, you are right. Because look at, I mean, I would say majority of us have lots of things to be grateful for in all the gratitudes and whatnot. Mm-hmm. And it's like, Oh, if I would stop focusing on what I'm perceiving somewhere else and actually focus on what I have, what a difference that would make and talk about the biggest joys that would bring. So oh, that would that be my so- best advice. Oh, I love it. I love it. Okay. I know you're writing your book, but are you reading a book right now? Yes. Um, uh, Counterfeit Kristen Chen. It's awesome. Ooh. It's a great okay. little spy. It's, I think it's on a Reese Reese's book club reviews. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Uh, Best concert. You have all these girlfriends, so I know you've been to a couple of concerts. Best concert. I, uh, hands down, uh, Prince, Purple Rain, 1983. Oh, I cannot believe you remember the date even. What a tragedy that we don't get to go to his concerts anymore. Oh, my so gosh. Sad. What a talent he was. And his music is will last. It's timeless. Um, timeless okay. forever. <laughs> Yeah, forever. If you could travel anywhere, where would it be and why? Do you hear my dog? I'm so sorry. Doggies. Yep. That's okay. You know what? I would actually like to finally get to Santorini and making this place. So I haven't been there yet and um I will get there someday. I apologize. That's okay. <laughs> We're almost done. This is life. It's life. Okay, your top three forms of self care are Oh, well, igniting. Absolutely. Um, any of your classes and your leaders classes. Um, I think sleep is, I love mm-hmm. sleep. It's one of the mm-hmm. best things. Um, and, um, uh, the other thing I do, um, each morning when I let my dog out, I sit outside of my house, rain, sleep, snow, hail. Um, and I can sit for about 10 or 15 minutes and I just sit without my phone and, um, think about the day or set intentions. And oh, wow. um, I do that. So. What an extraordinary discipline. Now, it doesn't that always is. work out the way I want it to, but it feels good at the time. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. I love that. Um, what's something most people don't know about you? You've shared a lot. Is there anything that we still don't know about you? Well, um, I would mentioned that we traveled um, a lot growing up. My, um, Aside from English, um, of my language, my first two languages were uh, German and Cantonese. I had 12. I definitely didn't know that about you. And I know you for a long time. Can you say anything in either of those right now? I can say some phrases and speak a little German. It's not fluent anymore. I wish I could speak it fluently. Would you be able to interpret it if somebody was speaking German to you? Um, It would have to be very basic and elementary German right now. I'd be better speaking it. it than interpreting it. Okay. Makes sense. Okay. So, so glad that your last day was not in the Adriatic Sea. If you could choose your, if you had one last day to live, what would your meal be? What would you choose to eat? My friends who uh, know me really well know exactly what this answer is. And ironically, it has to do with the sea, which is interesting. Um, Dungeness crab. Oh, that's a good one. Russell would join you in that. 
Yes. Is that because you're from Seattle? Yes. It's just, uh-huh. yes. Yeah. I am like, an, I can get every possible morsel out of that chef. I'm an <laughs> expert at Dungeness Crab. Mm-hmm. Oh my gosh. We got to get the two of you together. Y'all would be all, he's a Marylander. So yeah. Um, okay. So you have a son, you said son in college and two in high school. So for those of us who don't have kiddos in high school and college yet, which is me, mine are behind yours. What type of mom parenting wisdom can you share with us with getting a kiddo to college? And I know that you probably are uh, just, you have a lot of wisdom given that you just went through the college prep, college application process. But you have, um, you have high school and college, and that's a lot. So because this is the power of we and we're all about sharing wisdom, what wisdom can you give us about Wisdom about that. Well, let's see. Well, first of all, I think my husband and I joke that we have decided that if we completely lower our expectations, then we might not be as disappointed (laughs) sometimes. It feels like. Um, No, I'm kind of happy. To the expectation thing. It's like you don't want to be a pessimist and you don't want to raise the bar (laughs) so low. But if you raise it too high and you only see like, rainbows and unicorns all the time, there is going to be a, there is going to be some disappointment along the way. So that is, that is a tricky spot to figure out. A little humor, but really I think it's, um, you know, it is true kind of what they say of, you know, smaller children, smaller problems, bigger children, bigger problems. But, um, so with that, um, with that truthfully comes, um, bigger joy and bigger pride as well. But there's going to be worry and anxiety created with having children that are growing up and all the expectations around. So I think my words of wisdom would basically be um, just to really trust your instincts and to do what you think is best. That is so good. Thank you for sharing that because that is, a, and I think in our all of our heart of hearts, we know that, but ultimately as parents, as just people, we don't want to make a mistake, especially when it comes to your kiddos. Um, wow. That is, thank you for that because that could, that could be said for anything. So thank you. Trust your instincts. True. Okay. What would you tell your 20 year old self? Oh, my 20 year old self. I would probably say, um, to enjoy more of the moment that I was in, I think that I had had so many, um, I created more anxiety within myself to always want something else, always want that next thing, Mm -hmm. always striving for more. And I think I would say, you know, slow down, kind of appreciate what you have right that moment. So strive for Mm -hmm. more, but I think I would have Mm -hmm. tried to enjoy that a little bit more. Yep, that's good. That's hard balance to all to people thinking about the future and setting goals, but also being grateful for what's here. It's, let me know when you master it because I <laughs> I'm having always trouble. a work in progress. Okay. Yes, definitely. Two more questions. What okay. is a source of joy for you? Uh, the ocean and sunsets. Mm. And there are some beautiful sunsets in Texas. And in uh, San Diego. And when we go to San Diego for a renew your retreat. Yes, indeed. Definitely inspiration and joy every day. And then what are you looking forward to? Because we've been talking about the book and my story, I would say uh-huh. the day that I can actually physically hold my book because it's been released will be literally an epic and monumental day of my life. One of them. So sure. Well, I got to tell you, I'm looking so forward to two things. I'm looking so forward to sharing the joy of that moment with you Mm. and seriously, um, celebrating you and, um, telling everybody like buying a gazillion copies of your book to give to every person I know. I am cannot wait. I, I know we've all told you this for the longest time. We cannot wait to celebrate that moment with you. And I cannot wait to launch this podcast and make everybody um, a, even more aware of your story or those who aren't aware, aware of your story and get excited also about your book. And thank you so much for sharing all that you did. We spent a lot of time covering a lot of things, but I felt like it was, it was so much goodness. And thank you for 
um, for being part of the Power We podcast and sharing your love and your wisdom and your encouragement um, and just you for the last hour and 47 minutes. Thank you, Sam. Well, has been a while. well, it goes back. I mean, thank you for all of your support. I mean, the whole Ignite group. I mean, I, you know, you inspire us and you absolutely um, exemplify the power of we. So and I appreciate all that support. And, and the day that we do get to celebrate this, yeah, you're going to fly down because I'm going to have to throw one hell of a party, release party. Oh so, God. yes. But, but it's because of I you guys wait. that you're just so supportive. It's, it's really, well, that's, um, that's been never going to change. Official. You're a rock star. So, thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank Mwah. you. Love you. Thank you. Love you too. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Power of We podcast. And if you happen to be in Austin, we would love for you to join our fitness community. But if not, I would love for you to join me and our at-home fitness community. Most importantly, thank you for being part of the Power of We family.